bunch of people aren't back from lunch, uh, let's go ahead and get started. Um, this is something a bit different for me, but um, the, 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 I'll explain quickly where this is coming from. And most of this is incorporating Deleuze, Protevi, Delanda, other people, and we've been doing these types of things for a pretty long time. And um, it fits very well into, into uh, ideas about domestication, particularly in Mexico. Um, so I asked, well, John was invited separately than, my, than me, but was sort of talking about putting this session together, and I've been talking and working with geneticists and other types of people in Mexico. So it is fascinating that there is some sort of interest in Deleuze from the hard sciences. There are almost insuperable, some not insuperable, but very difficult uh, barriers. But there is an openness, at least in Mexico, I think it's appropriate also with uh, Manuel being here, and it was incredible for me to go there to people that, wow, this is fascinating, and, and you, can, you can plug and, and reconnect and so forth and do this kind of assemblage thinking. And uh, much better than the reception than sometimes that I get elsewhere. But um, the name of the project that's ongoing is this idea of tying cycads to the domestication of maize. And we've never seen a case except with corn maize where you have a, an, a perceived ancestor or relationship that is completely non-genetic. That is, you know, cycads that are, are, are uh, gymnosperms have no genetic relationship to maize, but they are perceived as this. And so you'll see a little bit of this. I don't know how much I'll get into in the second part, but you can see this online. I put a, a few of the slides from another presentation, the nice ones with all the photos, and it kind of looks at how we're looking at these landscapes and then going back through time and try to figure out is there another way to explain domestication. Because as you'll see, or if you've already looked, the, the explanations we have for this are no good anymore. And the recent literature basically um, admits this. So, um, but this is the project, and it got funded by the Mexican National Science Foundation, amazingly enough, because it brings together genomics, archaeology, cultural geography, qualitative, quantitative, various teams of researchers in the National um, Biodiversity and Genetics Laboratory in Mexico, in Irapuato. And so, um, and the reason this kind of happened was because the other main researcher on here, uh, Dr. Cibrian, was working independently on genetic data and uh, realize, with psychads and realized something was going on. The humans were doing things with psychads thousands of years ago and moving them around and, 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 this, and so we started connecting these ideas together. So we formed this kind of, uh, you know, this connection and started to bring other researchers in. I won't, John will be talking obviously about genetics. I won't have a lot more to say about that. But um, let me go back uh, and I'm going to take this off. What I wanted to do, if I'd had more time, was to get in and um, this off and just show you. That I don't know how well you'll be able to see these, but I wanted to do the more in flowcharts and diagrams and so forth. So um, bear with me. We'll see what we can see on here. For contrasting, I'm going to go in and break down. I'm assuming that I don't know where people would be in these different literatures. There are vast literatures on domestication and they're separated around the world. So the Mesoamericanists really aren't talking to the people in the Middle East. I'm going to look at the case of Australia where it never happened and, uh, and so forth. Um, yeah, I'm just going to take that off, thanks. Um, so, but basically what I'm doing is when you consider the traditional views of domestication, uh, clearly, we could see that it's an assemblage uh, in many interrelationships between humans and plants, animals, and so forth over time, but it's supposedly happening independently in different areas, without diffusion or contagion, right? So, for example, the typical view from us, this D uh, set of assemblages and instantiations as society, so let's say the traditional narrative in the U.S. or whatever, it goes back in time, and of course you be more primitive, and you go back to hunter-gatherers and so forth, and so introduction of new technologies, new tools, new ideas, and you have this natural um, progress to where we are today. So you start with people that supposedly just foraged, right, and then there were these revolutions that occurred. And most of this stuff now we know is wrong, misinterpreted, and so forth and so on. So if this was the Middle East, or you could think of, you know, Neolithic Revolution and so forth, and maybe you could say, okay, it affected this area and that area, but it doesn't explain Mexico, for example. So you take the case of Mexico and maybe more recent, and uh, you end up with D. And so you come up with all these different supposed hearths, and then you find out the hearths themselves is basically, it's a bad construct. The more we look, we see that these are occurring in myriad places. People are domesticating 
and pseudo-domesticating, proto-domesticating, cultivating many plants and animals and trying to. And so a lot of this has been extremely reductionist because, of course, what we, what, what we have is the explanation of why we are here and why we are America or whatever we may be, whatever empire. And this is what, you know, states have done. And so, of course, they've diminished the importance of this. And so, of course, we're flipping it around because this A, these assemblages, stretch back from millions of years evolutionarily all the way up to 10,000, 20,000 years ago. Right? And so we really are looking much more at this because this just you know, is indicating these connections don't work. So if we get rid of the stages and other things I'm going to mention, it occurred to me, and this is why in the research project I showed you, it turns out we have to try to integrate all of these different um, fields of research using assemblage theory, which is an enormous task. Um, and I don't know if this has been done before because working with chemists and uh, geneticists and so forth is quite challenging but trying to explain basically maize domestication. And we'll get a little of that today, probably just a little, raise a lot of questions and ideas. A lot of this is in pre-publication right now, this year, next year, start getting some of it out. But what if we take it the other way around and we say, you know, we look at societies or the intensive processes, the assemblages, the interlocked intensive processes that lead to these instantiations as a specific society in a specific landscape. You know, if we treat this as non-cultivation, this is the norm for as long as there have been beings in a landscape, um, depending how far back you want to do it. And at a certain time, you get to be, and you end up with uh, cultivation assemblages. These are these uh, hunter-gatherers mostly were not this that we know of. Uh, they were not the way they're portrayed, and they were doing plenty of cultivation, as we'll see. They were farming landscapes with fire, they were transplanting, they were doing all sorts of things. And so, but then the B, inevitably the narrative, and it does, it gives way to C, domestication assemblages, fully farming societies, herding societies, or mixtures. And again, these are, these are as you could probably guess, arbitrary, heuristic uh, um, tools we can use to kind of break down D is your agricultural dependent assemblages and um, their instantiations. And this you get beyond societies that have domestication, fully domesticated uh, plants and animals, and societies that are completely dependent. All right. And then from here, we don't really know where we go. And we don't go back to A if we collapse, necessarily do different things. So I've been thinking of the virtual. What is the virtual of this, however you want to talk about it? Um, I worked a lot with the idea of virtual, intensive, and, uh, and actual. Um, so the virtual, the capacities, most likely I'm calling it the dreaming out of what I've been reading about Australia because it's very poorly understood. It is not dream time, it is not dream space. It's something here and it's some communication. Of course, a lot of it is done through actual dreams, but there are many, many, many other ways. I'm just trying to get to a kind of defining an element of human culture because agriculture and domestication are human. They didn't happen because some natural force caused it, uh, a field of, of differential relations to capacities and so forth. But I'm just in the beginning stages to kind of think of what this virtual would be, particularly in Mexico. What produces maize? How do you come up with the world's premier domesticated crop that is, in essence, completely genetically enslaved? Um, and so just, uh, I have to bring this back down over the top of it, but maybe it'll help a little bit when I run through the, the more linear um, presentation here, bring this thing back on. Um, and I found out working with a lot of, with a lot of people who do incredible people, I've worked with people who are at the forefront in Mexico particularly of trying to figure out the genetic transformations that took little Teosinte um, ears and turned them into maize, it's not still, under, it's not understood, right? And, and I've asked this question, well, why did people do it in the first place? Because now we know there really wasn't a need. All those old explanations are wrong or um, partial, and so, so why did people do it? And they kind of shrug their shoulders and they can't figure it out. Uh, no, I mean, no one's really been able to, and of course, going back that far and trying to reconstruct this, you're limited by a lot of, um, by, 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 by many different things. So, um, okay, now how do I get off of this? Okay, it's on there like that, all right. So. So in general, what I'm going to do is, and this is combining those two talks, by the way, because the other presenter was not able to come, the other presenters or the people behind this from Mexico. So I've kind of taken that introduction and then this other part and fused them together, and then John will come after that. 
and then uh, Manuel will, will discuss. Um, so what this part isn't so much, I mean, you can be thinking of why I would want to do assemblage instead of this linearity that just doesn't work very well. Um, and trying to figure out what some of the main variables are. And I didn't throw in a lot of authors, but uh, it's, uh, there are some very important people, and a lot of them, they're not thinking about assemblages or anything, but they're definitely open to this because they cannot explain it. I'm using Australia now, I'm doing field work in uh, Arnhem Land, in Northern Territory. Um, one of the closest we have to a remaining complex trans-egalitarian, a hunter-gatherer assemblages where you have a lot of these traditions still active and trying to get inside how people relate to the landscape. Being a geographer, I, mean, I talk a lot about landscapes, of course, as we reconceptualize this, but that they never needed to develop agriculture. Then I'll switch back to Mexico, and um, it's uh, also, for some reason, not uh, showing all the slides on here. I can see, I think, sized wrong. Oh, boy. Um, oh, well. I'll do it again. Um, so a few clarifications on the definitions of what we're trying to do. We're looking specifically at domestication, and we'll define that in a second. Uh, when we talk about farming, we're not necessarily talking about crops. We're not necessarily talking about domesticates. We could be talking about fire stick farming, but it's transformation of the landscape. Cultivation, we're not also talking about domesticates necessarily. You can cultivate plants in your garden and do horticulture and so forth and so on. It really depends on what literature you're following and what part of the world. There's a term proto-domestication, which I don't really like because it kind of says that there's this linearity and all the proto-domesticates ended up as domesticates. It's not true. This is an extremely long period of time. In the Middle East, up to 10,000 years of proto-domestication was working fine. Uh, there's a landscape approach, I mentioned this, there are many gaps in methodology and so forth. And a lot of what we, we think is wrong is just how long this, I think, has been misinterpreted. Um, and we're looking backwards from here. So I'll probably, some of this is going to be cut off and I'll just, I'll just talk over it. I can see it here. So domestication, by the way, is not limited to plants and vertebrate animals. Remember bees, remember fungi and lactobacillus. It is also not defined as specific to humans, uh, i.e. humans. Domesticating uh, is also recognized as what leaf gutter ants do, cultivating uh, domesticating fungi. Um, but it is genetic changes, induced uh, genetic changes, selection, um, and, and reforming and creating something new that the farmer does, except it's the hunter-gatherer that did it, um, resulting in phenotypic changes in biota. Right? And so they become partially or wholly dependent on human beings. And so then, of course, they become something that we can't do without. Um, and this is fine. It can be partial, it can be reversed, and so forth and so on. Um, it's been going on for the last 25,000 years, in a certain sense. The last 10,000 is what most people cite, but it really depends where and where you would draw the line. Um, so questioning the impetus for domestication. Uh, the traditional explanations are this. People needed to produce more food. Uh, People need to have a uniform harvest, for example, a non-shattering rachis, and so you could harvest it all at the same time, and you know, this was supposedly one of the big things that happened, and it's, well, all, most of these up here aren't really true, it turns out. It happened quickly. This is one of the worst errors. So Michael Perugin and Dorian Fuller and so forth have talked about slow domestication. This takes thousands of years. It's not like a genetic change happened and no, they harvested it and that's domestic. No, I mean, and this is what we don't understand through these snapshots, is how long this takes Genetic enslavement, what else? Uh, it seems to be necessary for social stratification, all these things, stratification, all these things that we talk about, accumulation, um, it's also not necessarily the case. And it's talked about as something essentially different, a revolution, which it is not. Um, what else did I say down here? Part of an intentional de deity favored or induced stepwise progression to civilization. And so there's this idea in all of our narratives embedded in our school books that somehow this just happens because, again, they were starving or they were this and that, and then we end up what we have now, as if it's just automatically going to happen. And driven by a limited set of factors, um, this popular, oh, it was caused by this, oh, it was caused by that, and people quarrel over it. Well, it's quite obviously something much more complex than that. So the ones in error, for example, which I've already mentioned, kind of domestication as something that happens worldwide and then breaking it down, trying to figure it out from, I guess, the wrong direction in a lot of ways, why it's happening. Um, so we've already said that. 
There are many counterexamples to everything. For example, if you know Poverty Point culture, if you know the cultures of the Pacific Northwest, you have complex hunter-gatherer societies, very stratified, very segmentary, and they're not relying on domesticated plants, they're relying on fish, they're relying on other resources. And so, you know, you don't have to have uh, some sort of hierarchization and so forth to have agriculture, and it doesn't occur in a vacuum. Um, so we don't have a good reason anymore for why societies would domesticate any given plant or animal. And this is a big challenge for modern research, and this is why a lot of archaeologists that I've met are now working with geneticists, they're working with cultural geographers, this is happening, and I think it's going to happen more because they're just simply realizing that all of this is, you know. So this I've mentioned, Ohalo II in Galilee is very interesting. Over 20,000 years ago, and there was proto-domestication take place, taking place, people were harvesting crops in the wild, millets, I think, or um, if I remember correctly, or wheat, uh, wild wheat, which isn't that different from the domesticated version. And this went on for thousands of years. In Mexico, it was a, it was a species of millet. They never domesticated the millet in Mexico, but they harvested huge quantities, right? The research looked at the maize and pretty much ignored all of that so there are many domestication experiments that failed, and it's possible that domestication was the norm, the trying to control something and trying to put it close to you and trying to, in the case of cycads, get a cone, get a, a plant that can produce cones in, in a year instead of a thousand years. In some cases, cycads are very, very long-lived plants. And so, you know, experimentation is something that's going on for an extremely long time. People are tinkering with everything. And this is one of the basic messages that's come out to me dead ends all of the time, particularly with animals, which we don't talk about as much. Mesoamerica has very few domesticates. Um, so why was this desirable? Because at the end of it, you really can't come up with an example. And when you look at Australia, you see very high population before basically the genocide and the population collapse after 1788. And you start wondering, and what within the literature is, is very heavy on trying to figure out why Australia was unique. And we'll talk a little bit about that. It's become a huge fascination of mine. And this last part, which you would think, which I thought would be a big deal in looking at the maze and the psychads and the phallicism and so forth, this would be a big deal. I found out, no, it's been avoided, except when you're looking at, um, you can't see this, but uh, in Middle Eastern scholarship, a uh, scholar by the name of Jacques Cauvin, C-A-U-V-I-N, that tied together in, in uh, Gobekli Tepe in Turkey, um, and talked about the role of religion in the domestication of animals, right, cults of different, you know, and so forth. Um, but in general, this has been largely overlooked um, within, like, the big, the, the most funded projects, particularly the genetics work. Um, so this Australia 1788, pre-1788, I'll get to um, in a minute. We all know, of course, and we learned this in graduate school, geographers particularly, that domestication is one of these livelihood strategies. I really don't like to you know, label society based on how they happen to get their food, but of course most or many societies are mixed, as is our own in the United States. There's a lot of hunting, there's a lot of gathering, and so forth and so on, and you have you know, people in landscapes doing this. Um, and this is true, of course, that as this becomes more intensive farming and herding, uh, Societies then rewrite the entire narrative, and of course the hunter-gatherers get, get pushed out to the very edges. There was a thing I showed where the D, the assemblage, kind of has swallowed up everything else, and the hunter-gatherers with the most knowledge, and the most accumulated knowledge in the case of Australia, are the most minimal and most marginalized, which I think most people know. Um, full domestication is comparatively rare. Uh, and in most cases, a lot of things we think of as domesticates, like capsicum chili peppers, aren't, are, are easily are, are able to hybridize and are able to spread back out and to rewild themselves and so forth and so on. So again, it makes it very confusing. One thing to be cautious with, if you come like me out of a cultural ecological background from LSU geography and so forth, is these overly ecologistic kind of this... Uh, um, the equivalent of scientism is kind of fetishization of ecology can solve all of our problems for human beings, but when you're looking at domestication, it's much more than ecology, and it's much more than something that we can do through equations. Uh, Eleni talked about, when she talked about SES, um, you know, talked about these ways of approaching it. Most of our, my research is entirely qualitative. Um, and so we need to, you know, be careful here. Uh, and be careful of the demographic concepts. Oh, there were more people, they needed more food. 
entire careers have been spent on this, and these are all partial explanations. Maybe they work in one place, but they do not work overall. Be very careful of many approaches, perhaps most. They simply completely avoid the roles of religion, or if you don't like that, political economy. You know, um, so, and then this that I learned, you know, local people are not all knowing, they don't perfectly adapt to, you know, to the landscape and establish some sort of equilibrium. Most of us know that now as well, but these are some of the baggage that's uh, there as well. Um, so maybe I always like this uh, Pierre Klaas that, uh, that Deleuze and Guattari talked a lot about. Um, what we're really talking about is state agriculture and what it entails. For example, with the Nile, you know, you had the agriculture arises, all these systems arose, hydraulics, and then it was overcoated by the um, increasingly, you know, by and, and during the first uh, kingdom and so forth, and you have serfdom, enslavement, corvée, etc., etc., and you have heightened dependence on further sources of food. So there's a lot of politics and a lot of religion here, and I think that's what's missing in those quote-unquote first few thousand years. Um, and then another thing you see is food today, we only stand, understand it as food systems and you, you would think that way and you're supposed to analyze it that way and yet we go back 8,000 years ago and we say, oh well, we, we don't really even think about that kind of thing and yet of course we need to when we look at these areas like Mexico where we still have very little data before four to 5,000 years ago. Um, so the Australia case, uh, I started to bring this in because psych ads uh, were heavily used in Australia and were quote unquote fire farmed, like a lot of things. Um, Harry Lorendos, an arche archaeologist out of uh, Queensland, very influential. So it wasn't necessary, of course, working with now Aboriginal societies who themselves have the land and are bringing in archaeologists and other geographers to work with them to try to figure a lot of this out. Uh, this is very exciting. Um, I'm saying, you know, societies didn't intensify and reach some sort of dynamic equilibrium, for example. This, this idea of a romantic, you know, hunter-gatherer in Australia who lives lightly on the land is false. But they were trying to reconstruct, you know, after all the racism and so forth and all of the marginalization, kind of paint them very romantically as ecosystem people. They are not ecosystem people, and they were not. But uh, so to kind of understand why that happened. We're going back and seeing the things that did happen in Australia, particularly where there were um, certain resources in the less nomadic areas, where there's less, where, you know, wetter areas and so forth, uh, where the edges, uh, eel trapping, so very complicated fish farming, a lot of marine stuff as well, millet, um, and there's evidence for gardening tubers but not transforming them, for example, wild yams, putting them in a certain place, but of course this was obliterated very quickly after 1788. Um, fire stick farming, of course, across the entire continent. Just imagine that you're able to manipulate a landscape so you could move emus from pasture to pasture by these burning regimes, and so you're essentially you're farming the emus. It's pastoralism without the genetic change. Um, so agriculture never occurred or developed, and that's the odd thing, after 40 to 60,000 years or more, and very close to New Guinea, on the Cape York Peninsula, New Guinea, of course, intensive agriculture, very heavily studied, and doesn't appear to have passed southward as it easily could have and spread. So there's a lot of work. So, you know, if, if this is of interest to you, there are vast literatures, and they're more than um, restricted to Australia, and it's been over-determined. Uh, to the extent that we really don't even know how dependent they were, because if you look carefully in some of the very fragmentary archaeological record, which is biased toward maize and a few other crops, on um, the iconography, a lot of what we see as maize may be psychic tones. There are numerous errors that actually uh, come into this. Regardless, there's this sort of haze, like, you, like all of a sudden people started doing agriculture, and so unlike other areas in the world, there has been very probably because there are no hunting gathering societies left. Uh, in Mesoamerica, or Middle America, Mesoamerica, there just isn't that interest. And so we're lacking. One of the things we're trying to do is get back 8, 10,000 years using new technologies that allow us to look at the pollen and do other things and figure out exactly the archaeological assemblages, what they're seeing in the, in the stratum, um, what's going on there, what was going on. And like I said, we don't, this is critical because this is a very fundament of Mexico and much of world civilization now, and, and we don't even understand the genetic changes. We understand a few, but not all. This took thousands of years, but it spread rapidly. So all of a sudden, they transformed Teosinte into maize, and then it's popping up all over the place. Genetic explanation was not domesticated independently somewhere else. So how did it do that? 
It was not eaten. Maize was not eaten for thousands of years. Other things were eaten, cycads were eaten, all, all sorts of other plants. Eventually, maize becomes a staple. So all of this has been kind of pushed out. And when you think of what this means, you've got to figure out that maize was domesticated for something other than food. Because they're not going to spend thousands of years trying to turn something like this into something that becomes a staple crop. There must have been something else going on. And there are theories about this. I'll mention one in a second. What we're calling these people, we don't think of them as these egalitarian societies or band societies, whatever. These are called complex trans-egalitarian assemblages. Um, I've been calling them assemblages of uh, people's landscapes. The B particularly assemblage that I kind of found in, in that model. These are the ones that domesticate maize. Most people don't think, they're thinking, okay, there's a farm. No, this was all of these crops were domesticated by people who were not farmers and did not become farmers in the process of doing it, in a sense. They did not settle necessarily in villages. That was thousands of years later, perhaps. And it's not, and chili peppers as well, very, a lot of sacred content with chili peppers, among other things. A lot of, uh, a lot of, like I said, a lot of sexual content and so forth and so on. And when you, when you talk to people in Mexico, a lot of people very open to this anthropologist looking at the religious, the symbolic, but thinking that far back. Um, okay, so how do we reconstruct? This was a new term for me, but it's very exciting, this idea of how to do ethnoarchaeology. And these projects, particularly with hunter-gatherers, are unbelievable. The UNESCO has a new effort to try to do this. Um, there are a lot of reasons why. And uh, working with the societies themselves, uh, and it's happening in the U.S. and Australia and so forth, Finding these traces in the present, because clearly this is a retention. Deer hunting, for example, all these different things that take place go back thousands and thousands of years, so it's retained. And so these different assemblages are all captured by what I, what I call D. They're all still there in certain fragments. That's the ethnography part that I'm working on, and then trying to get back, like I said, get back to this, uh, this earlier part using other techniques and using genetics as well. Um, and the other stuff I've already mentioned. Here's a here's an exa counter example from Brian Hayden that's worked in the Pacific Northwest West with these hunter-gatherer societies and has looked at maize as well and proposes that the reason that it's developed has to do with uh, status, that they were traded in feasts and the groups came together and feasts went long distances, elites did, to show off their products. Maize is a perfect example of this um, and a reason why a maize or, or a, a uh, Something that, looked, something that was a type of psychad in a sense at that point, we think, would explain why maize moved so quickly. Vast distances, um, moths in Australia, psychads in Australia, etc. All of these great ghost feasting. And so looking at something that's, you know, assemblage that's, that's created and repeated in space and time somewhere, it's a very different way of thinking why, particularly shamans, people with religious power, would want to acquire these items. Maize cycads are extremely phallic, and they're also both used for intoxication and uh, hallucination in the case of cycads, it turns out. And so there's a lot more there to think about once you break out of those um, old models. Reconnecting elements of new models here that we can uh, plug into these different assemblages that I'll break down uh, quickly in a minute. Uh, I think we can re reconnect new and old world cultures if we think that 22,000 years ago people were in essence farming grasses. Well, that's longer than the time that people came from the old world to, to the new. So treating, you know, people were using fire. They were connected through generations. If Australians are connected through thousands of years, clearly that there was a connectivity between Asia and the new world. Scholars, however, don't necessarily emphasize that, but they should if we're thinking of this global virtual um, you're, you're drawing from something. There has to be some explanation as to how these types of things arise separately. I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Um, it's very speculative. Interspecies communication is the biggest thing for me, and I think it's one of the most important things to talk about. The first very important person I met in Arnhem Land said you need to understand, first of all, that we're not more or less than animals or plants. We can become them, they can become us, there's this connectivity and so forth, and they say, I am basically a bird. And we would say he plays that bird in ritual, he represents them, but this is not what is meant. And what is meant is interspecies communication, this is what we evolved as one species among many, and we learn from them, and they learn from us, and so forth. And so looking at that, very rich literature emerging, multi-species ethnography, and trying to figure that out. So we extracted ourselves as human beings and distanced ourselves from that. There are many great examples now of co-evolution 
without domestication. Um, also this idea that people come into new land and then they just figure it out and it's for people coming into new land 10 to 20,000 years ago, it's already densely inhabited by other non-human people, plants as well as animals, right? So they're already there, so you communicate with them. And so again, getting in the minds of people 10 some thousand years ago, of course, it's extraordinarily different to, and may only be in the realm of theory, but it's something to think about at the bottom. I said there's no tabula rasa in this. Um, so assemblages, to go back to that, the way we're trying to break this down and think about it, is getting back to these, right? Uh, this I already showed. The virtual I mentioned. And when you think of the virtual in different ways, and this is all just very preliminary for me, and certainly has the genetic potentials as well. So these aren't just, as you can, uh, you can think of dipping into the virtual and kind of extracting from it. And as society does involve new things or learn, the virtual changes along with the actual, right? So you don't get the same virtual that you can go back to. The Australian Aborigines have a new virtual, including in their dreaming, right? It includes us. It includes everything that they're doing, you know, and so this is so very interesting as we go into, you know, there's a temporal element here that, that we're not denying. The actual, as like I said, the spatio-temporal instant, a society in a physical landscape, a human landscape, that one, this one, or that nation state, etc. and so forth. Um, all right, so the, so the intensive here, What's getting you from this virtual to whatever your society is, right, are these interconnected processes. And there are many, right, and you end up with this set of livelihood strategies, right, that produce a society. The site is the product, right, so this is the process. Um, I don't go into all of them here. But this certainly does form something that's, that's metastable. There are basins of attraction. You do get stuck. You get very dependent in space and in other ways. These can switch, sort of. They're not going back to the same thing, but you can get these kind of ideas how you can think of these. And we often portray, you know, the end of the world that way. We all go back to being hunter-gatherers. Of course, it's absurd in a certain sense. It wouldn't work that way. But we did see with post-1492, post-1788, we go in and we look at these societies and the Spanish write about these people living in the forest as if that's the way they always lived, even 400 years later. And yet they are the remnants of very, I hate to use the word complex, but very uh, stratified and hierarchized uh, chiefdoms and so forth and so on. Um, so assemblage converters, those red arrows I had, you know, what takes an assemblage and switches it to something else? And these are incorporated in creating this assemblage, but also these are disruptive events. And people will focus now on climate change, extreme weather events, a tsunami, bushfires. So the instance of bushfires in the Australian bush is formative for that assemblage. Extremely important, but too much bushfire, something like that, can of course completely destroy. So fire has that tectonic events, we're seeing this in Mexico pathogenic events, and so forth and so on. Contacts with other human groups being one of the major ones, conquest, destruction, uh, conversion, all of these types of things. When the Spanish missionaries came in and tried to take the uh, certain groups and make them farm to make them Christian, you know, stop them from wandering in the wilderness and that sort of thing, um, this is seen everywhere. So we've got a rich resource on how some of this works because we know it and we've seen it. Uh, fluctuations in availability of resources. So a lot of energy has been spent in this kind of just measuring it all out and seeing if we can just create enough equations, we can figure out you know, how this happens and we can also say that these are the triggers for domestication within the, how these assemblages are converted. Human demographic growth, a particular non-favorite of mine, but, but it is important. Miraculous events can't be, dis, uh, things that can't be explained, so forth and so on, and of course genetic events and probably many other things. Um, all right, so non-cultivation, the A, then this is all of human and pre-human, so again, all that, you know, all that interspecies communication and all of those genes and so forth accumulating until very recently. And I think I've already said a lot of this, but I underline the interspecies communication, the fact that you have this full communication going on. And it's both ways, by the way. The honey gatherer, the, the, the honey, uh, honey guide in Africa is a bird that communicates in a language specific to, to that species and human beings. A very famous example. It's co-evolved over about 100,000 years or more. Um, and so you have you know, co-evolution, 
without any type of domestication, but you have effective communication to lead to a food, a food resource that benefits both human and honey diet, the language that mediates that. So communities of beings, uh, lack of things we think of, I mean, there is hierarchization, but it's not strict, it's not extremely, uh, land ownership exists, but it's territorial in very different ways than we think of with great clashes in Australia. It's not that they're not traditional owners and so forth, and, but it's just done extremely differently. Um, we know that this had to do with resilience and uh, uh, being, to be able to adapt to change. We're not saying that they didn't. Um, what else? And some of the things that I've already mentioned there. Uh, note that the very bottom says, note that language and tool use do not separate humans from non-humans. Even fire does not do so in Australia. The specific project in Australia is to show the widespread belief and actual occurrence of birds taking firebrands and spreading fire on purpose as a tool, which is what we're involved in right now, which Aboriginal people attribute their knowledge of where fire comes from. So it sounds like folklore, and in this case, turns out it's a real thing. So increasingly, the more we learn about birds and so forth, the more we see that a lot of this is, uh, is very closely interconnected. So B, just this intermediary, when you start doing cultivation, these proto-domesticates, this goes on for, in many cases, thousands of years. So your hunter-gatherer groups are doing all of this as well, in many cases. Um, and they're planting and selecting and so forth and so on. So this is where domestication happens in this one, but the assemblage, you don't have that conversion until the see the domestication assemblage. And this is where you get these suites of fully domesticated, human labor dependent, whatever, what we think of as genetic enslavement, and then of course one gets dependent on the other. Neither can do without the other one. And when this collapses, it can be obviously catastrophic. Reorientation of religion, so you're going to invent uh, you know, new deities or retool old deities and so forth. I would comment that again in Australian Aboriginal thought there are no deities, right? So we say religion, we're not talking about that at all. So some of the transformations taking place, spatiality shift quite clearly, um, gender roles, another something that's being heavily studied, um, not just gender but also the roles of children. Um, there is generally less mobility in society. I mean, there pretty much has to be. You can't leave your farm unattended uh, for very long. And um, did I have a, a calendar? Yeah, this the reorganization of time is extremely important. The calendrical systems end up almost controlling, a very incredible controlling factor. So agricultural calendars, once they're set in motion, they're controlled by the highest authorities, as they are in our own case. And uh, it doesn't seem like you go back from there. Um, there's so many different structures that get introduced and interlocked, and this is why the C then gets, you know, get, turns into D. Um, what else? Uh, yeah, so this is seen as the dawn of civilization when really it's the end, and a lot of people have written about this maybe romantically and so forth, seeing it as a failure, and I'm just kind of taking that kind of baggage out and saying, you know, what was lost and then what was added, and how do we figure out these different connections, whether you want to work at the level of the virtual or the intensive, um, you know, how, how and why this happened. And the last, and the agricultural dependent assemblages, basically the entire world today, in, in, in a real sense, having swallowed up everything else, uh, the, the global capitalism, whatever you want to call it. Um, all of this is, I guess, obvious. Um, you don't need the state for this. Quite clearly, you have many societies completely dependent on agriculture that also ward off the state. Permanent communities with outlying intervening farms um, tend toward hierarchization. In many cases, not all. Uh, there are many cases of farming societies, the Amish, for example, who are very differently structured than our own. Um, incorporation of strong elements, so all this kind of swallowed, however you want to look at it. Return to the Mexican case here. Um, the as I've already said, the maize comes before, but it's often thought of as something invented by farmers. It's not, not the farmers that we would think. And we want to try and understand interspecies communication. We don't have a lot of, we don't have a lot of ancient stuff in Mexico we can look at. We don't have the kind of imagery, iconography that you find in the old world in tropical conditions. It's harder to find, but it is there, and it's largely been neglected. Mexico has archaeological remains up to 10,000 years ago. There's some baskets, there's some weaving, things like that. And then, many other ways maybe to do this. I think this is very important getting into the minds of shamans today because that's the carry through. 
in many ways. There's the role of the shaman, which is very alive in Otomi society or Nawa, or whatever, but it's very secret. You can't just go and do research in it. A lot of the virtual also is covered over by this, hidden. Um, but trying to understand now and get back, you know, and, and trying to see what's going on with the sacred nature of this and why are they making these strange connections. You know, um, the Milpa, for example, isn't just maze. It's, it's an incredible dynamic system. It's very fluid and extremely deep when you get into try to understand how they are experiencing creating the, the Milpa. So very quickly, um, with this case, which may or yeah, we'll go through this quickly. Just in case, well, I'm talking about this a little bit, uh, psych ads, you won't see a lot of this, but um, they look like palms, they're unrelated to palms. Um, actually, they're culturally related to palms as another element of this landscape in which domestication arises in Mexico, but they're essentially different. They live for thousands of years. They're a male and female plants, dioecious. Um, they're gymnosperms, um, and so forth and so on. And they grow all over the tropics of the world. Most of them are endangered. So they're extremely important also for the history. They're the origins of insect pollination and lots of other things that go back millions of years. Psychids are eaten, but they are incredibly deadly. If you prepare them wrong, you will die. And there are many instances of this. Um, this is from Australia, from a, from a botanical garden in Darwin. But you know this is the kind of thing that occurs in Mexico. And it's been an obsession of mine for a long time to try to figure out how important these are, because these can become staple crops, because they produce massive numbers of these cones that have starch that people make into bread and so forth and so on with all of those risks. And they also have extreme sacred significance like a lot of plants. Um, so for example, these are ranges of cycads in Mexico and one thing that we saw is that cycads and maize here are thought of as the same thing. They're the same group among the Nahua and other groups of people in northeastern Mexico where I'll show you a few slides in Oaxaca and Honduras where all this started. Psychads are father of maize, mother of maize, um, ancestor of maize, shepherd of maize, as you'll see, and essentially sacred maize as it was transmitted to the Nahua as Teosinte. So in other words, there's a whole Teosinte out there, and this we've definitely already published on. The Teosinte here in Mexico are psychads. And the Teosinte down here, that's actually a term that came from Guatemala, um, what, what the scientists call the, the genetic ancestor of maize. And so it opens up this whole realm, you know, how do you deal with this? I think if people think of this as a sacred ancestor, how far back does this go? This is not something new. Um, so some of these connections that I mentioned, um, they're both types. One is a type of the other, the same conceptual group uh, in many societies. But this isn't something recent. Maize is right next to cycads, and some of the most famous but cycads were ignored. Sierra de Tamaulipas, 4,500 years. Cycads and maize in the same stratum, the same assemblage. Um, cycads have been eaten heavily. Uh, and there is no other plant like cycad. One of the things that we check for is there another plant that's the ancestor of maize in that sense. There are cousins and so forth, but there isn't this kind of relationship. Um, they intercrop them. Psychads are seen as superior food by some groups. The identical, we think that some of the things that were used for psychads were passed over into maize. Um, maize is, of course, superior. You don't die if you, if you, uh, if you prepare it wrong. Um, and there are deities that overlap, and there are representations of these deities and representations of psychad cones that people have apparently mistaken for maize, for example, possibly among the Olmec, and there's some people studying that. So this is it surprised a lot of people in Mexico, and they become intrigued by it because cycads, being a wild and poisonous plant, were completely ignored by the Spanish, and more recently because it was just something out there that was not important. But cycads positively influence maize growth. Well, for example, if you look at a milpa among the Huastec, a Maya group in northeast Mexico, and they have very fluid, very processual thinking. They never speak in terms of fixed entities. Everything is connected to everything else in their language and philosophy. Uh, working with a, uh, a healer there, a type of shaman, I guess, and being introduced to different, now this is the milpa, this is the, the cornfield, but it's protected, these are psychads around the outside. Protected in certain actual ways, not just, you know, in some sort of religious sense, but literally protected, drawing away pests and so forth and so on. And this incredible functionality um, within all of this milpa, so it protects, this is something in very traditional backgrounds that will protect it. And it is also the spirit, the cycad, and the bigger, the forest and the cornfield are the same thing in this society. They're just transitions from one to the other and then back again. And then the cycad is the spirit somehow of all of that 
and then it pulls down the rain and the clouds. And it's just absolutely amazing when you have the questions to ask and, and, um, and so forth and so on. Uh, and then also in that same region, uh, the Nawa. Uh, so here's a, here's a cone right here. And we'll see a couple of photos of a cone. And um, all the same words. And in this case, you have insemination. The male cone, this is the male cone right there. Ine or toro, which means phallus, bull's phallus. And then the pollen is the semen, and it is moved through the air. It's actually insect pollinated, inserted in the female, which is there. That's the female cone close up. And uh, they're aware that that pollinates the cycad. However, the belief is also that these two fused, male and female, became maize, which is male and female on the same plant. And so, uh, male, maize, male, ma maize is the child of this union. And you can see this in these virpas, in this area of the in the Alba state, among the, the densest uh, number of Nawa remaining, the, the major uh, concentration in Mexico is there. A lot of shamans and so forth, but we're someone willing to talk about this open knowledge. And so here's a virpa, it's been burned off completely, slashed and burned, they haven't planted the corn, there's some palms that survive, and here the cycads popping up. They're deadly poisons. Okay, if your kid were to eat one of those leaves, he'd probably die. A lot of societies that don't know this will get rid of these, but they believe then that all of this is a sacred form of maize and protecting it, and it somehow, as the cycad grows, the maize grows as well. Um, again, this makes no sense. This makes no sense within concepts of how would you understand uh, you know, agriculture and the origins of agriculture. We think it's kind of a view back. This is uh, the seven ears of Saikad, which turn into the maize deity, Chico Mesochi, with seven ears. This is simply, this is maize itself. So you can see in this case of a small Saikad how similar they are. Um, and you know, there's a lot of other things as well, just trying to look at that landscape view and interpret it when they're out there. Um, and some of the rest of the slides I put in here. This was taken into the Catholic Church as well when it wasn't confused with palms. And so a lot of psychic festivals in Mexico, Day of the Dead, psychics are heavily associated with death around the world and resurrection and so forth because you can basically burn them.